Good afternoon, um, everybody, um, and welcome to this first interactive webinar of the UCAT 2020 Symposium, which is co-hosted today uh, by the Ertico Academy Friday webinars. So my name is Stefan Drea. I'm senior manager at Ertico ITS Europe. And I'm also the coordinator of the Arcade Coordination and Support Action, which is organizing the UCAT Symposium. So the title of today's webinar will be how to support first inno uh, fast innovations through different levels of physical and digital infrastructure measures. Um, and uh, we will have on the next slide, we can see a great panel of speakers that uh, and I will let them afterwards introduce all, all themselves before the, before the presentations. On the next slide. So before we start, I would like to say a few words about Ertico, uh, the Academy, and uh, as well the Arcade Project and the Symposium. So first, Ertico is a public-private partnership um, of, of uh, representing uh, 120 partners today uh, from eight different sectors. So these include mobile network operators, public authorities, research service providers, suppliers, traffic and transport industry users and vehicle manufacturers. And all these stakeholders work together on one common goal, which is to uh, develop smart and support the deployment of smart mobility uh, in general. Uh, among our activities, we have uh, we are involved in EU-funded projects, but we are as well hosting eight self-funded platforms, and we are also organizing an, uh, the uh, ITS Congress when it's happening in Europe and co-organizing the ITS Congress when it's uh, happening uh, in the other regions, so in the in, uh, Americas and in Asia. Uh, another activity is the uh, Ertico Academy, so which is hosting kindly the, the uh, webinar today. Uh, this is a newer activity by Ertico where we are developing training material based on our expertise from us and from our partners on the different projects we are involved in, but as well on from the uh, platforms uh, and uh, where we provide this training material. So there's already some training material available. So if you would like to learn more about that, please consult the link uh, here at the bottom, vertical.com slash academy. So in the next slide, so a few words as well about Arcade. So uh, Arcade is a project that is coordinated by Ertico. It's a coordination and support uh, action funded by the European Commission. It started in 2018 um, and is about halfway through. Um, but it is it is building on a long legacy of coordination and support actions on the area of connected automated driving. It started already in July 2013 with the vehicle road automation project, was followed by the Cartre uh, coordination support action uh, from 2016 to 2018, and now uh, we have Arcade. So we have 23 partners, but we rely a lot as well on all the associated partners, we have more than 50 today, and as well on a large network of stakeholders. So on the next slide, we can see this, we have in our case three main pillars, let's say. So the first pillar is really the stakeholder network. So this includes you as well today as participants to this workshop. It includes all the participants to our regular workshops that we organize uh, across uh, uh, with the industry and also research and public authorities. Uh, with the different experts. We also involve the projects, so we organize regular project consultation events. And all these partners get together in order to accumulate knowledge, exchange on lessons learned, and identify gaps, challenges, and priorities for the next, for the future research and innovation actions. All this content feeds is, is gathered across 12 thematic areas, which we are working on at the moment. They are very aligned with as well uh, thematic domains that have been established by AirTrack. And in the end, we feed all this knowledge into a knowledge base. So I really uh, invite you to, con um, to consult the knowledge base. So we have the link here at the bottom. Uh, this is one of the main achievements of, of Arcade today. You can find there an extensive list. We have more than 200 projects and trial and pilot activities listed today across Europe. They are also searchable according to thematic areas and to specific keywords. 
And the final objective is that all this knowledge feeds into roadmaps. So we are producing, as I said, a consolidated roadmap, which is updated every year. And it feeds as well into the uh, AirTrack CAD roadmap, but as well into, it has fed in past to the STRIA roadmap from the European Commission. And we are now as well supporting extensively the uh, CCAM platform, which is currently developing as well the strategic research and innovation agenda for Horizon Europe. So on the next slide, so one of the main, so in addition to the workshops, uh, we are also organizing several other networking events. So we are co-organizing with the European Commission every two years, the UCAT conference. So the last one uh, took place last year in 2019 uh, in Brussels. And uh, in between the two years, we also organized the symposium, which is a might slightly small, smaller event, but where we focus really on some more key uh, challenges still remaining to, to be discussed in for the deployment of connected automated driving. This year, the UCAT symposium was planned to take place in Helsinki uh, together in parallel to the TRA. Unfortunately, because of the cancellation of TRA and as well the current situation, we had to reschedule uh, the symposium online. Uh, so what we have decided is we will do a series of webinars. We had initially planned four workshops, so we will do four different webinars. The first one being today on physical and digital infrastructure. The next one should take place in June, so the date is still to be fixed, probably around mid-June. It will focus on validation of connected and automated vehicles, but as well with a strong focus on, on human factors and how to bring all these, these aspects up to to consumer testing then we have two other webinars which we are planning more for the second half of the year one being on uh, on sustainability of transport so does automated driving support sustainability and the last one on aligning views on the terminology and common description and methodologies beyond the pilots and FOTs. so this is a very important aspect today we want to define what are we speaking about when we are exchanging about results or defining methodologies. We need to have common views on, on terminology and, and in particular use cases, scenarios. Um, so this still needs to be defined. So we'll please stay tuned and consult regularly or the website of connectedautomateddriving.eu or uh, join us as associated partner and our mailing lists. On the next slide. So before now handing over to our moderator, Armin, uh, I would like just to provide a few uh, webinar rules and the process. So the webinar is being recorded. All the slides, the results, and also the recording will be shared afterwards and published on connectedautomateddriving.eu. We want to have this webinar as close as possible to an interactive workshop, which was the initial plan, because we would like as well to uh, get the feedback from all of you as much as possible and use it as well when we will define the, the future roadmaps and future priorities. So for that, we have decided to use another tool in parallel to go to webinar, which is Slido. So we would like to ask you to, if all the questions that you have, please use Slido so you can uh, open it it on you, it, you don't need to install any application for that. You can just uh, connect to the website, uh, www.slido.com, either on a separate tab on your browser or on your mobile phone. There you enter the code. Uh, the event is uh, hashtag UCAT 2020. And then you click on the event name to start using it. So please only use Slido to ask questions. We will also use it to have some poll questions in between the presentations. Um, and uh, you will be able to interact through that and you will and um so all the questions that you ask during the presentations uh, we will try to answer them after the presentations and if you have a present uh, a question that is for a speaker who already presented in the past then please indicate the name of the speaker in the questions so that's it for my introduction um i'm handing over now to Armin Greta from BMW, who will be the moderator for this session. So Armin, the microphone is yours. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I like to welcome everybody again from my side. Uh, my name is Armin Greta, as uh, Stefan already mentioned. I'm working in the BMW Group with a long history of of electronics uh, and safety um, background. And uh, at the moment, I'm technical product manager for regulation uh, of automated driving, uh, but having also some other strategic tasks within the BMW Group. So um, I'm also having the role uh, to co-chair the AirTruck Working Group on Connected Automated Driving, and I'm leading the Working Group on Automated Driving within the uh, BDA, the German Automotive Association. So, <coughs> sorry, sorry for that. Um, uh, having said these uh, words, um, I'd like to go at first before I go into my uh, no, sorry, please back. Uh, before I go uh, into the slides uh, of my uh, presentation, I'd like to start a first Slido poll so that you can uh, get used to the to the tool. And uh, I'd like to ask you in an open question: uh, What is your category of stakeholder, so that we can see um, how many different uh, stakeholders uh, uh, categories are available in this webinar? This is a nice information, I think, for everybody. So please go ahead, open Slido, and uh, write, type uh, the best way only one word so that you can see now these um, um, words coming up and you see how many people are there and uh, where are they from. This is, I think, a quite nice thing to, to test the, the tool. And um, uh, I see it open, opening and starting. And maybe we can look at the result uh, after my presentation again. And then, no, we can not do that, sorry, <laughs> because I have also another Slido poll within my presentation. But you see it coming up, and it will be documented afterwards in the in the uh, documentation of the webinar. So now coming to the to my content, um, as an initial part, I try to be very um, general and to introduce many of the aspects which the other speakers will uh, deliver in more details and with more focus on other parts. So I like to give an overview on the whole connection between automated driving and uh, infrastructure. And uh, what we did in the past was uh, delivering the AirTruck CAD roadmap uh, last year. Um, and uh, this had the task to uh, increase the scope to better cover the connected aspect of automation and strengthen the links to infrastructure, and also uh, showing that automation is not a subject of uh, a technology coming to everything all the time, but uh, having concrete development paths between, so we want to differentiate between passenger cars, freight vehicles, and urban mobility vehicles. On the next slide, you can already see that infrastructure uh, support levels for automated driving were established in this roadmap. Uh, Jacqueline will go deeper into this subject later on in her charts. So you see that there are different levels. And in this case, the area of Graz uh, is an example where you can see how uh, a link between two motorways is could be covered by different levels of infrastructure support. I don't want to go into the details here because this is a matter of Jacqueline later on. Um, on the next slide already, you can see that this is a kind of the framework uh, of all these things. How do they link to each other? We have uh, now first regulations out from the Geneva UN processes, which is uh, called Automatic Lane Keeping System Level 3. Um, this is a draft version which hopefully will be uh, approved in September in the next uh, official meeting. Um, in Geneva, uh, this defines operational design domains, for example, and uh, the homologation framework is uh, covering the operational domain of vehicles with their designs who, who drive on roads. Uh, so, for example, on the, for the highway use case, the operational domain is defined by having a road with a constructional separation to the oncoming traffic, only an example. Uh, but also, we have uh, traffic rules, which are typically covered by people driving the car. But when we have level three or level four vehicles on the road, then there's no driver anymore. So the car has to have obligations to be fulfilled by the vehicle driving strategy at last. 
and this is defined uh, by the traffic regulation framework and now we have the link between uh, all of them which is the IDAT levels which help the uh, car making let's say a driving strategy which is uh, correct which fulfills all the laws but also helps the traffic flow so this is uh, one, the first aspect of uh, having maybe a link to the fall webinar where we discuss about what is the effect of, of automation on efficiency and other things. I also don't want to go in the details here. Um, so on the next slide you already see um, what is the key challenge now having talked about the regulation framework and all the um, surroundings and the new task of the vehicle being the driver. So these are things which uh, really define the technology itself. And uh, this chart is quite complex. I'd like to explain it a bit in more detail. If you uh, look at uh, the axles of these charts, on the horizontal axle you see the driving speed of the vehicle, and on the uh, y-axis you see the complexity of traffic scenarios. So um, if you try to solve the problem of automated driving, let's say it like this, we have to face both challenges at the same time. So it's not a surprise that uh, level three will start uh, with uh, quite low speeds and on highways, because this is the most simple use case on the lower left corner of this graph. Um, we would expect to have the speed quite easily being um, higher and higher by the time. So there's even already a regulatory approach running to uh, exceed the speed up to 130 kph which is just in preparation by industry and some member states, um, the, or not member states, but countries who are participating in the UNEC process. Um, saying this, uh, it's clear that uh, highway use cases are completely different than urban use cases. So what we expect is in the uh, first generation of level three cars on highways in the 2020s, um, and even level four on highways may be earlier than level four in urban areas because the speed, uh, now having said, uh, discussed this for many years and having development projects uh, also within the BMW group, but with many others, uh, the industry learns at the moment that the speed is uh, not the, the, or the challenge for urban scenarios is much bigger than the challenge to, to get higher speeds. This can be done by better sensors and better perception systems. Uh, but on the urban environment, uh, we are not uh, that robust yet. So the over next uh, step would then be introducing level four as a first generation phase in starting in the 2020s. Uh, it's most likely that this is not uh, already in the next years a robust use case. So we see that the trials on urban environments are running for years and years and the progress is not as big as you, some people have expected in the past. The, the last uh, word I want to say to this graph is, um, if you want to go to rural roads on the countryside, then it's even a bigger challenge because uh, you have the quite high speeds of 100 kph, for example, in many countries, um, and you have all the complexity of city scenarios, maybe not in the density of a city, but all of them are there. We have pedestrians, we have bicycles, we have crossings, uh, and this with the high speed. So this is a kind of um, no idea when this will be able to, to um, be handled perfectly. So we expect rural and countryside use cases uh, much more on a very specific um, solutions like uh, on specific roads or for specific use cases uh, in transport and, and for, uh, example elderly people or something like that. Um, but now coming to the key for this webinar, um, what are now from a really industry point of view, not so much from the infrastructure side uh, developed, but uh, knowing the development around autonomous driving in the industry, uh, what are the key enablers uh, in the infrastructure to uh, speed up on the development of automated driving. On the highway side, very clear the high definition maps um, have to be updated very frequently. So we talk about uh, minutes or even seconds in the future. Um, and this means that uh, we need a, a good bandwidth to have these high definition maps always in the car. 
you can imagine these are kind of uh, clusters of of road segments which can be uh, uploaded to the car all the time so uh, maybe the first solutions in the market will show that a minute wise update would be enough but maybe later on it's better to do it on a second basis um, also digitized variable traffic signs uh, will be a very big will have a very big impact and also uh, real reliable real-time logic localized traffic infos so it's very important for the automated car to understand quite good uh, where the limits uh, may occur so that the handover to the driver can be done uh, as early as possible so that there is no risk in the takeover and uh, this helps a lot for the acceptance and also for the reliability and the performance of the systems on level four in urban areas i just mentioned this is an even bigger challenge the challenges are, are uh, digitized traffic lights um, and also the uh, real-time localized uh, traffic info with other aspects which i don't want to go in details because of of timing and uh, we will see many more details on that in the other presentations on the next slide we have a slido question again so uh, please take your slido tool again may it be on the laptop or on the phone um, so which uh, digital infrastructure measures um, do you see um, coming up and um, you have this uh, multiple choice uh, to you can do that and after my presentation we will look at the results so on the next slide um, I only want to take the picture to to explain a bit on the technology of the on the vehicle side in the in the vehicle infrastructure let's say not in the road infrastructure but the vehicle infrastructure because perception is nice and planning is nice but if you don't have uh, a backend which delivers the high definition map and updates and and the learned algorithms for for the artificial intelligence then all the car technology alone will not uh, cover the the requirements so it's it's a good perception system the car has to plan where to drive it needs to uh, execute the driving and everything the whole circle needs to be validated by simulation also this uh, as a very short uh, input uh, for the discussion later on on the next slide you see already one of the three uh, development paths roadmaps which are published by air 2019 maybe not everyone of you have seen that yet i only want to mention that we have a focus here on um, highway autopilot uh, maybe including convoy this is not in the in the first uh, priority focus but i i expect it to come up quite soon when when we see level three solutions uh, on the roads and anyway it has a synergy with the trucks we will later on see and then the urban and suburban pilot uh, level four solutions will be the matter of research uh, for the next years please be aware that these roadmaps uh, look into trl levels so technology readiness levels of seven to nine this means this is not a, a primary research but it's also not uh, a serious development so it's it's just the, the pre-deployment the pre-development phase and and the, the application research work which is necessary uh, as you have seen in my other charts most of the um, technological approaches uh, what needs to be done what needs to be developed uh, is there so the idea how it could work in the future is there but it's a lot of work and a lot of research questions in detail to be solved before it comes to the road and be industrialized especially on the next slide uh, you can also see the uh, freight vehicle development paths uh, they uh, look like uh, in a similar way but the use cases for freight transport are slightly different or definitely a strong difference there you also see completely other types of, of vehicles for example when it makes much sense for big logistics companies to have uh, driverless um, robots uh, uh, arranging the the truck trailers uh, at the at the um, hubs so and also hub to hub operation could be a very very interesting use case so this is again one of the big steps where infrastructure could help a lot because we will see that there are hub to hub um, let's say um, road uh, uh, road nets uh, which are quite small 
but if they have a, a strong infrastructure with a high ISAT level, then there will be much more use cases uh, and very quick, quickly to be um, established. So this is also a very good chance to to uh, speed up on automated uh, truck transport. On my last slide now, um, we see also the urban mobility vehicle development paths, which uh, are around uh, public uh, rapid transport, personal rapid transport and shuttles. So um, I know many people don't like the word of the robot taxi, but uh, uh, this is kind of uh, easily speaking. Uh, so shuttles and, and smaller cars uh, could be a very, very important change of urban mobility at all and even solve many, many of, of the issues which we have today with the uh, road transport. So I think this is the, the key, um, the key uh, solution to make uh, cities more liveable and uh, also address all the targets which are set um, from the political side uh, for this research work uh, which we are executing here in the European uh, Union. So this was it from my side um, as an input. And now we can look at the poll results uh, which we had in the middle of my presentation. Okay, so we had 46 participants in this in this poll, um, and um, ah, it's just uh, going on again. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Thank you. So some others uh, will have mentioned um, also uh, what what they uh, see there, and we will collect all this also, and afterwards look at it and and uh, and refer to it. And you have also the question uh, if you have mentioned others here uh, later on or just now after my presentation. Um, okay, these are the direct uh, others, but uh, I think that's enough for the moment. Um, uh, if we go ahead now, it's uh, open to um, questions, I would say. So please uh, put your questions to the Slido and uh, we have a uh, uh, back office team to um, sort it out and uh, we try to be as good as possible to answer what we can do now but we are a bit in a hurry uh, so uh, it's not so much time to answer to, to them. Um, yeah, a uh, good question here uh, is uh, about the high definition maps. Um, I, what I just uh, tried to explain is that it's very important to have uh, uh, big clusters, as big as possible clusters of map in the car represented so that the um, time interval, uh, if, if the connection is lost, uh, can be as big as possible. Uh, and at last, uh, it would lead to get, taking over to the driver. That's why we start with level three. Uh, we will see how it works there and then we can uh, let's say, do the measures to, to be reliable enough for level four. And uh, then we have uh, level four passenger cars in the mass market. That's a very good question and I can't answer it, to be honest, <laughs> and nobody knows it yet. Many people have tried, but uh, uh, I, I see many years uh, to come before this will come to the market. Uh, you can now discuss if many is one or five or 10. But uh, it will be not. Le I, I don't believe in one, and I don't believe in ten. But uh, I can't say more on that. Um, political willingness and financial support by the authorities is a very good point, and it's very clear that uh, uh, this uh, needs to be discussed in the in the groups where they work on it, like like Cedar, and maybe Jacqueline can can come back to that in a minute when she has done her presentation. I would leave it at the moment for that and uh, hand over to Jacqueline Erhardt. Uh, she's working with ASFINAC and she can present herself. Thank you very much for the moment. I'll be back for the discussion at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, Armin. Um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Jacqueline Erhardt. I'm working for ASFINAC, the Austrian motorway operator. Um, in my department of um, ITS services, um, I'm the team leader for the cooperative connected and automated um, driving and also digital infrastructure team. 
And we are working on physical and digital infrastructure elements, but also services which prepare our highways for um, autonomous vehicles. Armin teased it already that um, infrastructure could play quite an, an interesting role in, in the whole ecosystem of autonomous driving. Um, from, from an road operator's point of view, we have to just think about um, right now about the operational design domains for the new generation of vehicles. So as mentioned before, um, we will have different levels of automation, but from, from a road operation point of view and the traffic management point of view, we have to really consider what happens if a car or a truck enters our highways and how will it also exit our highways on a safe and, and also still an efficient traffic um, way um, at, at the, the final um, destination. So for us, it is really important that the automated vehicles will or are able to handle different traffic situations where we have um, not so many cars on, on the road uh, or also in, in urban high, on urban highways where we have quite a lot of traffic and so quite a complex um, effect on, on, the, on the driving situations um, which needs to be handled by the machine or the vehicle itself. So on the next slide, you see what, what we have in mind. Um, with the next click, you will see that, for example, um, local roadwork zones, which are not planned so far, I mean, we are planning it, but um, which are just happening for on, on a daily base, so where we have to close um, lanes, might be a situation where a vehicle needs to, to hand over the, the driving um, responsibility to the human driver. Or another example for losing this operational design domain could be quite temporary adverse weather conditions. So um, by the next click, um, what, what we have to consider right now is, um, do those new generation of vehicles really have the same information or do they need more information to do their maneuver planning or their the drivings? Um, and um, so when we consider it, we, we have just to assume that a machine just needs a different kind of information which the human driver needs, because the human is, is adapted to really um, to, to evaluate different situations. So here's the question, um, what kind of infrastructure, but also what kind of digitalized infrastructure elements could be necessary to still have uh, reliant and also safe traffic. And that's why with the next click, um, we introduced the, um, the infrastructure supported automated driving classification, we call it ISET, um, where we assume that the infrastructure is there like it is and the car has to, to deal with it um, like it is. But of course, we, we invest and we also believe uh, in different kind of digitalized services which may support um, those vehicles um, with different levels in taking the right decision and also plan a little bit in advance and have a smoother handover to the driver. So um, in, in my first uh, slider poll, I want to know from you, what is your opinion about which infrastructure services would enable a seamless automated driving on, on the motorways or in urban spaces? And we would really be interested in, in your opinion. So I think for, for the next slide, I will um, take over the control of the slides. And I hope you can right now see my, my slides. Um, so what you can see here is the, um, 
Jacqueline, we don't see your slide. Okay, thank you very much. Do you see my slides now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so what you see here is, is the classification. We we have structured the scheme in, in different um, classes, like starting with E, where the vehicle needs to really recognize the road geometry and all different information on its own. And we level up till the highest level um, of automation, where the infrastructure is really having a kind of cooperative mode and supports the vehicle by maneuvering through um, difficult situations. So I, I would be curious about uh, the poll result in, in what services do you see? And so that we can then right now analyze in where we can just audit in, in which kind of class. Well, since I'm presenting, I, I cannot see it, I think. But we will go back to, to it later. Okay, so for the classification D, I said we, we will step by step increase our level of digitalized representation of um, the infrastructure. And for the lowest classification, which has already some digital background, um, every one of us maybe have it, um, and I'm quite sure you will maybe have um, a map. Um, a map service in your car or you will just have right now a kind of a smartphone which can guide you through the situation so what we assume um, could be there in the lowest level is just this information about the road geometry and the static information on the road which you can already see on on your map provider um, devices and that could be a good base for autonomous vehicles to plan accordingly um, the speed but also um, the, the maneuvers but of course it will not be at the latest status and it will not be in real time so at the next classification um, we would see already that more and more information is available through um, digital services not in in real time but at least to to be there um, like traffic regulations like information about roadwork zones um, so that you have already this this content about where should be a, a roadwork zone on the network which lane should be closed um, then also of course the information of variable message, variable message signs um, where is is right now um, a limitation of speed um, or um, also from a database um, knowledge, um, where are the, the incidents um, happening on, on the network. But of course, it's still not like Armin said in real time, but could be sufficient for the first generation to, to drive safely um, with this minute-based um, actual data. But what is more interesting um, and, and on a and kind of real-time traffic information is um, to get all those messages like the incident, that there's a broken vehicle, that there is a roadwork warning or zone right before you, or that there is due to this traffic management of, of organizing um, an incident or, or a roadwork zone, also limitation of speed. We could have this direct communication in real time to the cars. And that's also why um, Asfinag invests in, in this technology of real time direct communication um, to, to indicate on the, on the one hand, really uh, road safety um, relevant information. On the other hand, um, and I hope it, it works for you, um, is that with this direct communication, you also open it's a different flavor, but you open another possibility of um, communicating to cars. We assume that we will have for the first years connected cars, automated cars, but also normal um, vehicles. 
So the whole orchestration of, of difficult traffic situations could be a little bit facilitated by sending recommendations for lane changes, for sending information about um, the distance gap between two cars, so to support really the, the, the safety maneuvering of cars in, in specific traffic situations. So that will not be needed everywhere, but at specific um, sections of, of the network um, that could be relevant. And for the highest level of, of this classification, we assume even to have in real time the, the full um, knowledge about traffic situations and um, about everything happening on, on specific um, parts of the network. So what you can see here is um, when we just um, invest a lot in, in infrastructure and generate um, a full scope of, of the traffic situation, we could be um, able to send over a complete object detection list where we have um, the, the car um, classification, the speed and, and the heading of, of the car, um, and so get out a kind of, of overall perception from the infrastructure to support the vehicle's perception with this limited sensor um, distance um, capabilities. Or we could also automatically um, detect some, some broken down vehicles, but which could also be um, enabled by uh, some kind of direct communication. So to, to share this thought, it's about that the infrastructure um, is over all the whole traffic, while the vehicle only sees what it can see with its own detectors and sensors. So by combining both, we would just really increase the vehicle's perception. And that could also lead, if we have really a full um, equipment of, of roads, um, that we could guide um, vehicles through difficult situations. But we, I also have to mention that will not work to, to have a full equipment of infrastructure everywhere. Um, it, it needs to be still um, investigated which kind of services are really required to enable um, a safe and efficient automated driving um, composition of the full traffic and of course um, to identify really the, the most important parts of the infrastructure um, where this infrastructure support um, really has um, an added value and of course it's, it's a matter um, like the question before of financement um, that's why it's just in a kind of the scheme is intro or was introduced um, two years ago and now is, is trying to really um, have a little bit some some spotlights on different services which could enable and, and facilitate the introduction of automated vehicles on, on our roads. So to close um, my short talk, um, I would be really interested in um, which services should be further developed within the next year. So what do you see um, should be the service Europe should work on um, to, to facilitate and fasten a little bit the, the market entrance? And I will hand over um, the presentation. and would appreciate to have a look on to the Slido results. Okay, maybe I, I go to I go to do to the questions which you already entered. Um, there I see um, the, the first question about um, do you expect road operators will provide HD map information directly to road users? Um, so far what I see, I mean, uh, there are first um, projects ongoing 
something where a kind of layer information is provided, um, but in a sense of um, in a sense of of um, a topology um, point cloud. So I think should it will it be a real time? I think it it will not be a kind of of HD map, but it will be more like uh, some additional layer information. Um, there was another interesting question about uh, again the digital representation of traffic rules if they are needed as well, and the federation of the NAPs. I mean there are different flavors of of um, the national access points. Um, so there should be a, a common discussion. I think the discussion is ongoing about how to really um, digitalize um, the traffic rules. So I will answer a, a last question. Um, There was, um, to, to close and then hand over to Terry. Um, for the ISAT classification, have you identified a relation between the support provided at each level and the allowed behavior of CAFs and potential CCAM services that can take place? Um, so far, we, we did not consider to really have a one-to-one -one, um, relation between the ISAT classification and SAE levels, so levels of automation of vehicles. Um, because the ISAT classification has different flavors, as you might have um, seen in my slides, and therefore for this different flavor, it will be difficult to really have a one-to-one -one representation, but it is definitely interesting to see the potential of CCAM services. Um, but I think the, the first one which will be interesting to see um, is how the direct communication really has an impact on, on, on the traffic itself. And I think we, we start um, some kind of deployment in Austria or some kind. We, we start a CRTS deployment and we hope to see the first um, benefits um, on connected and autonomous vehicles soon. So thank you very much. There are a lot of, of more questions and I'm interested about the poll results. But I think my time is over and I, I hand back and hope um, to answer your questions later. Thank you very much. All right. So, well, I'm going to mention a few things. So my name is Thierry Gauger. I'm the Secretary General of FURL. Um, well, um, the adapta adaptation of road infrastructure to the deployment of connected and automated vehicle uh, has been something uh, in the air for a while. Also within the um, uh, umbrella of FURL, which is actually an association of uh, research centers uh, focusing on the um, uh, road infrastructure uh, research. In the next slide, uh, you'll see that um, we've been um, adapting uh, and looking for roadmaps uh, already a long time ago. You can even uh, go to the next slide, um, starting about five, six years ago, trying to uh, move on to the next generation of road, uh, in which one of the main pillar is about automated road, so roads which are able to uh, monitor their self-conditions, but also support the deployment uh, of automated vehicles. Um, in the next slides, we, we can also show that um, this effort which was paid uh, on the road has been uh, further, um, um, let's say, detailed um, and further worked with the other mode of transport um, from um, of course, the work that was done on the uh, Forever Open Road program, but put uh, forward to the 4x4 uh, open and integrated transport infrastructure, looking at the, at the side, at the road, the rail, the river, and the runways, but also uh, not only at technology side, but also infrastructure aspect, governance, and the shared customers. You'll need to click a few times to go to the next slide, please. In the meanwhile, uh, I can let you know that um, within Horizon and um, and the CEDAR call, there has been a few projects funded um, which enable to support this um, R&D uh, which were uh, put as a roadmap. Um, we had the chance to organize a workshop on the 3rd of March, probably one of the last physical meetings that has happened before the COVID-19 crisis. In that one, the idea was to, um, uh, well, 
invite the running one uh, and the ending projects, um, starting with the um, uh, EU ITS platform, uh, where uh, the idea there is to uh, uh, gather national ministry, road authorities, road operators and partners from the private and the public sector of almost all EU states and near neighbor countries. Um, well, they have, of course, a broad scope, but one of their um, uh, work package is on the facilitating automated driving, um, where they look at um, the roadmaps toward the deployment, but they also have a look, and this is also in the next slide, they also have a look at the socio-economic benefits. So this is a very broad umbrella uh, that, um, um, well, enables, in a way, uh, framing some of the step-by-step uh, -step, um, uh, deployment. Well, this was not the only one uh, we have already in the next slide. So we had um, a few presentations already, a few words mentioned earlier um, by other projects. So um, I will also probably focus on the, mostly the coexist. So well, anyway, within the workshop, beside the main framework, we, uh, we what we notice is that within the research um, done at the moment, uh, some um, achievement and lesson learned can be already taken from uh, uh, infrastructure uh, simulation um, or simulation of traffic, uh, including CAVs, uh, which is a very new feature now implemented in, in traffic modeling. Um, well, still, uh, there is a big responsibility in uh, this modeling on the modeler uh, to define the assumption how, uh, in a way, the vehicle should or will behave. Uh, and that's something which uh, is an important warning uh, to, to address at first. Um, what we noticed in the, in the coexist where indeed the, the main work was to, um, to build this uh, um, uh, new modeling integrating CAVs, uh, the driving logics uh, are um, at the heart of, uh, of consideration and um, clearly if there is already much research ongoing, there is a high need to uh, clarify and to define very clearly the driving logic so, so that the model in a way will represent uh, the, the reality. Um, the other aspect that we can highlight is that the city's expectation management in a way, um, well, they have probably lost a bit the, uh, the hype uh, around the CAVs. And um, now we are more in the step of learnings, um, how to prepare uh, for the planning. Um, considering that all uncertainty um, requires a structured way uh, of assessing future scenarios, uh, and that's something that um, we have tried to do in the Coexist framework. Um, please, the next slide. Um, well, the other very important uh, probably aspect that we can mention, and this is very crucial uh, for the deployment of automation and also for uh, the automation, uh, let's say the infrastructure uh, ready um, um, for readiness. Um, well, that um, we, we have demonstrated in the uh, coexist that um, more or less all the use case uh, simulation that we uh, run show a hell scenario at the beginning. So in other words, um, the introduction of the um, CAVs will most likely be um, uh, impacting a lot the um, traffic um, in general. So having a long uh, traffic uh, delay, longer time, longer distance uh, with uh, the transition that can also be relatively long. And that's a very important message that uh, we want to bring along because they will have a lot of impact on um, especially the owners and operators of infrastructure. Well, um, inserting CAVs, in other words, uh, in traffic does not necessarily improve efficiency. And this is, uh, well, in a way, uh, another comment that uh, another lesson learned. It depends a, um, a lot on the penetration rate uh, and uh, the driving logic. For the penetration rate, we have um, noticed that, um, well, we need about uh, 70 to 80 percent of penetration rate in order to show a positive impact. And of course, for the driving logic as well, we need very advanced, um, in other words, in other words, uh, driving logic that can drive as good as a human or even better than a human, knowing more or less uh, all the conditions around the vehicle. And with this uh, together, high penetration and very advanced driving logic 
then this can start uh, generating some gains. Uh, and that's something which is really important also to have in mind when uh, this will be uh, starting off. Well, um, last but not the least, um, opportunities of model shift towards integrated public transport with uh, automated shared fleets is also something uh, of very high importance. Um, and uh, of course, getting in mind that the service needs uh, to be affordable um, if we want to keep a social inclusion. Uh, and this uh, has to move indeed from a, a good feeling to a structured and informed decision making. Well, um, there has been uh, a number of tools developed um, enabling the assessment of innovative infrastructure measures. Uh, you've seen that already uh, in, the, in the previous slide from Jacqueline, and I will also highlight it again later on. But this was also the case in, uh, in the Coexist, where we can, uh, uh, well, where we show that the measure tested show mobility improvement, mainly for eye automation and penetration level. Uh, the methods uh, show that um, should urban road change in the transition towards CCM and, and how. So this was a big, uh, uh, big issue, and uh, we also uh, highlighted that how to ensure other modes uh, that are not negatively affected by uh, the introduction of uh, CAVs. Well, in the next slide. Um, we had uh, the Inframix um, um, well, uh, presentation, and well, Jacqueline already highlighted and presented very, uh, very well. So um, the idea here is not to do duplication. Uh, the Inframix, um, in a way, um, in the part of the simulation that Inframix made, they were very similar, uh, or they complement um, what was. Uh, uh, said within the, the coexist. So, in other words, there is a need for a very high penetration and very advanced um, CAVs on the road. But they also uh, highlighted a very important item is that there is a need to um, uh, focus, in a way, uh, the, the effort on specific environments or specific use cases um, before um, we think about um, deploying uh, on a large scale. And um, if we go on the next one uh, slide, um, part of the very uh, important work that was uh, developed there is about the uh, infrastructure support levels uh, for automated driving that was uh, presented by Jacqueline and is really one of the important tools uh, that can be definitely supporting uh, the very important decision-making process. Well, um, in the coexist, which is in the next slide, this is also uh, something which was uh, highlighted, um, looking at all possible uh, aspects of deployment from the policy, infrastructure, planning, capacity building, and traffic management, and um, um, highlighting that these um, outcome and this, um, uh, let's say, preparation could also be uh, better integrated in the SUM principle, which is uh, something developed at the high city level planning. Um, before I conclude, there is um, uh, in the next slide part of the workshop. Um, we have actually, uh, you can click several times to, to have the whole slide um, filled in. Um, there were uh, two other projects that were presented, which also have a very interesting, uh, bring interesting aspect. The first one is about uh, Staple, where uh, the idea here is to look at uh, existing test side uh, within uh, national uh, road authorities, in particular, or operators, uh, or uh, at, um, at the uh, private level, and um, having a look at them. Uh, and then the idea is actually to move from um, uh, the existing one, uh, which are often used in a confidential way, uh, to a better integration one uh, within the different uh, aspects from the NRS uh, to the supplier, um, and looking at how this test site can be, in a way, improved to bring um, the right information um, at the right time. And um, the question of data, which is in the next slide, is um, uh, in the two next slides, or you can click two times, uh, you can go in the next one. Uh, the question of digitalization is a very important aspect. Uh, what we could notice is that the cooperation is not uh, very good between the public side and the private side, and even within the public side as well. So the data exchange is uh, of uh, very uh, is very poor and needs to be very much uh, improved. 
uh, as well as the data quality. Um, there's been a proposal to, uh, to, let's say, qualify that with a number of criteria from geographical coverage to uh, predictability, so very important, um, uh, let's say, uh, aspect which is derived now from the Dairizon project. And in the next slide, Um, the importance of the cooperation between the stakeholders. So obviously, beside the, the confidentiality and uh, the cybersecurity, here there is a need for um, uh, establishing a good um, uh, collaboration, which in the next slide uh, is, is uh, uh, proposed to develop a digital platform, um, having clear rules about how to make it and how to run it, and, um, and definitely in the next slide uh, about its exploitation, so who is um, uh, doing what, uh, who is gaining what, and that's um, part of the upcoming uh, result that we will be uh, getting from the Darazen projects. So in, the conclu in conclusion, and you can go to the next slide, um, the idea of that workshop and maybe the main conclusion are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, three or four aspects. The first one is we need to focus on specific environment or use cases uh, to move forward step by step. We need to improve very much driving logics uh, within, of course, the vehicles, but within the um, um, uh, the simulations, uh, which is really crucial. And uh, maybe the last one is if we want to go safely, we need to have a no regret investment. So we need to identify the no regret investment to, to move forward uh, st steadily, but step by step. I had questions uh, from the Slido, but um, I at the end decided not to raise them, but on the other hand, I'm happy now to look at the Slido if there are some ongoing questions to which we could answer. Okay, so there is no question to show, but maybe in the discussion there might be uh, coming further. So in this case, I will uh, hand over to Yap, uh, who will uh, go in uh, in uh, in the presentation thank you Thierry, for handing over hello everyone my name is Jaap Vreeswijk I work at Map Traffic Management in the Netherlands, where I'm a traffic architect working on connected and automated driving. And in my talk today, I am also representing the Transate project, a project dealing with uh, transition areas for infrastructure assisted driving. And in this project, we've been examining the ODD from the perspective of transition areas. So, next slide, please. So this is an animated slide which requires um, a few more clicks. Um, we need to define a number of things. We need to define transition of control, takeover request and minimum risk maneuver. So here an automated vehicle approaches from the left in automation mode and he issues a, trans a takeover request and if that is successful the driver takes over but if it is unsuccessful so the trans the transition of control fails, the vehicle has to make a minimum risk maneuver. As you can see now, the vehicle in this case stops and doesn't enter the no automated driving zone. Yeah, it was a bit quick, but it's all right. We can move on to the to the next slide. On managing ODDs. Fortunately, this figure was explained by the pre one of the previous presenters. Um, it shows that an ODD has boundaries and gaps and therefore transition of control may happen frequently and when it does there is the risk of, of um, reduced driving performance in case the human takes over or a minimum risk maneuver in case there is no transition of control when the driver does not, not respond. And in, in our project we well, we took this as a starting point. The vehicle is unable to solve the situation ahead. And then considering the, the scenario where this happens to several vehicles systematically, which has a considerable effect on traffic flow, traffic safety, and other indicators. Next slide, please. So we started examining 
situations where this happens, uh, looking at statistics and, and, and information available on disengagement of, of automated vehicles and tests around the globe. And we found some examples that you see illustrated here, um, but we also found that there is uh, not a lot of evidence um, available yet that, that really provides a solid basis for this work. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, as a, as a question in Slido, you can answer this question. What do you expect? What do you expect a ZFE will do in case of a minimum risk maneuver? In the meantime, I would say I can proceed with my presentation. So while we were examining um, ODD uh, edge cases, uh, transition areas, uh, reasons for uh, transition of control, we started uh, decomposing the whole ODD, ODD theme. And here we've, um, we've distinguished seven dimensions that, that are of importance. Of course, these are the, the levels of driving automation as defined by SIE, which define the uh, vehicle AD functions and capabilities. The road environment matters, uh, whether there is access to the roads by other road participants, uh, whether there are intersections or not, the behavior of other traffic, the extent to which this is uniform or not, the presence of physical infrastructure measures, and the same for digital infrastructure measures, but also situational and environmental conditions matter a lot. If there is heavy traffic, if there are unplanned uh, events like uh, like the roadworks vehicle there, uh, weather conditions. Um, and in the middle, you see the vehicle and system operational performance, which is more or less the, the result of, of all of this, but also something that we want to achieve. We have certain expectations of how well the vehicle or the system should perform under different in different operational domains. So in the end, what we are looking for often is, is a geofenced area where we can uh, well confine the, the the use of automated vehicles next slide please so we in the transit project uh, one of our objectives was to develop um, uh, services for assisting automated driving and we did that on the basis of um, um, functions of the vehicle so roughly you could distinguish three the first is to sense and build environmental awareness and for that the support provided is uh, to provide relevant information which is also something related to the ISAT levels um, presented before so in this case it could be about digital map data ob detected obstacles uh, regulation information or dynamic regulations second level is um, the ability to plan actions by the vehicle and here the vehicle can be provided with operational support so provide an, an, an alternative action that the vehicle can execute such as path information a, a driving velocity a headway uh, a merge or lane advice and on the last level it's more a strategic level as seen from a traffic management perspective is to arrange favorable conditions that allow the vehicle to perform the action so that could be um, routing of traffic, it could be orchestrating traffic flows, orchestrating on what lanes traffic um, is driving, uh, but also scheduling of, um, of transitions of control and minimum risk maneuvers. Next slide, please. So we summarize this in five services. The first one being providing vehicle path information, and you see two examples of that. The second category is to provide speed, headway, and lane advice, for example, at signalized intersections or at merging areas. The third is to separate traffic, for example, to separate automated vehicles from, uh, from manually driven vehicles in case of narrow lanes at roadworks or at uh, weaving sections. The fourth is to guide vehicles to uh, a safe spot in case they have to make a minimum risk maneuver so they don't form an obstacle on the road. And the fifth is to distribute or schedule uh, the location of, of transitions of control. 
you don't have to wait until the vehicle enters a no automation zone uh, that could be anticipated upstream. Next slide, please. So on Slido, you can again answer a question, which Transate service for infrastructure assisted driving do you consider to be most realistic out of these five that I presented? Next slide, please. Over the past uh, year, we did extensive uh, simulation uh, work um, where we simulated both traffic and communication technology, and we assessed all of these services and their use cases that I mentioned before. This is the number five, where we distribute the, uh, the, the transitions um, upstream, and you can see the without traffic management case, so that's the before case on the left, and the with tra uh, traffic management measures on the right. And you can clearly see it makes a big difference uh, in terms of congestion, whether or not this um, measure is implemented. You can also see in these charts that we um, that we varied over various levels of service, different traffic mix. Um, well, this is a level of service C. We also looked at B and D, and there is um, a, a deliverable available which contains a lot of these graphs and is interesting reading material. Next slide, please. So here is another example from these, uh, this study. Uh, this is the, um, the, the off-ramp that is blocked by a queue. There is spillback on the, on the exit. So the vehicle uh, normally will stop on the, on the mainstream lane and uh, wait for a gap. Uh, instead, we, um, we advise the vehicle to join the queue uh, and wait on the hard shoulder. And if we implement that measure, you can see a, a clear benefit on, on both lanes, uh, as you would also expect with normal traffic, of course, if we, if we do that today. But it makes a, a big difference implementing a measure like this. Next slide, please. Since we're approaching the end of our project, we are also working on the exploitation activities to see how what we've developed can be implemented and operationalized with uh, relevant stakeholders, for example, road authorities and OEMs. Um, essentially, what we're doing is linking traffic management with fleet management. So we're linking the world of traffic managers, managers and road authorities with the world of fleet managers and, and, and OEMs. And this cooperation is not natural, as we have seen uh, in, and learned in the, in the past years, but there is a sense uh, of, of trust that is required. And there is a need of understanding and especially a need to align measures that are implemented on, uh, on traffic, on vehicles, on the road. So what we've been working on is the definition of an intermediary service that um, is a single point of access for both these entities and can interact with, um, with traffic through traffic information and traffic measures. An advantage is that this intermediary service can also be applied across road authority borders um, including those that do not possess a traffic management center, which is very common in, uh, in rural areas, smaller cities um, around the world. Next slide, please. Okay, something happened with the layout here. There are very small letters. I hope you can see them. This intermediary service has um, a lot to do with remote monitoring and control centers. What we've seen in literature and in pilots uh, uh, recently is that for, for now and in the foreseeable future, uh, level four autonomous mobility applications in mixed traffic to be safe and comfortable, they rely on a remote supervisory service of some kind. So if you'd like to drive without a steward or a fallback on board, uh, this, this remote monitoring and control center is essential. And services that the center might um, perform are listed in the blocks on the screen. So it, it's about um, monitoring functional safety, uh, technical surveillance of vehicles on the road, uh, scheduling of, of uh, vehicle services, vehicle dispatch and routing, 
support all the SANS plan and act stages of the uh, automated driving systems that I mentioned before. And here, obviously, the use of uh, vehicle to infrastructure communication and other roadside equipment uh, is needed. The status of the road network, uh, network traffic, roadworks and incidents um, is, a, is a service provided. Um, information and guidance along specific infrastructure segments, such as uh, bridges, tunnels, um, merging sections, uh, signalized intersections is another service. Also to facilitate the stakeholder interaction and manage clearance levels, uh, so where automation is allowed and where it is not. And last, to provide first and second line help desk services, but also run escalation protocols in case something goes wrong and other stakeholders need to act. We've observed that, uh, that, that all of these functions, if they are placed in a control room uh, remotely with an operator present, this also contributes to public ac acceptance of autonomous vehicles. Next slide, please. What we've been doing at uh, Map Traffic Management as one of the project partners of this project, uh, we've started integrating these um, remote monitoring and control functionalities in our existing service center where we do traffic management uh, services today. Um, we think that by integrating the, the different domains in one single service center, so the domains of traffic management, of uh, travel information services, of uh, vehicle monitoring and control in one place adds a lot of value because there is a lot of commonality between those operational processes and therefore can easily be integrated. Um, our ambition is to uh, have something that is multi-brand and multi-application and therefore can be applied anywhere. Um, certification is important and it's a common, um, a common element in, in the domain of uh, traffic systems industry. And we believe that an approach like this can also be scalable. Before I close, there are two additional questions. Um, they are on Slido. One question is, uh, what do you expect of remote control? There are five options to answer. And the other question is, um, on remote monitoring and control centers should be owned and operated by. And there you can select one or more stakeholders. That concludes my talk and thank you for listening. Okay, I see some questions. The first one is a question to everyone. Should the CIVs act selfishly as humans do, entering the network immediately and chose the current shortest route, creating the congestion, or the tactical behavior should also be optimized from a system-wide perspective to avoid congestion on the road network? Well, to answer to that question, what I try to, to illustrate is that um, is that vehicles should become part of the of, uh, automated vehicles should become part of the transport transport system they should become an integrated part of it and in the same manner as we do today there is some uh, some orchestration of traffic over the traffic network um, uh, from a traffic management and road operation perspective it only makes sense if, uh, if automated vehicles become an integrated part of that too The second question here is, did you look into responsibilities? Who will finance the support infrastructures? Who is liable if they fail? No, we didn't look into that in, uh, in our project, um, but there are some other projects that, uh, that did. Uh, we could get back to this question in the uh, meeting report, unless one of the other speakers wants to comment. The third question here is what are the trust parameters in case of links between road authorities and OEMs? Yeah, trust in this case is, is mostly um, on the exchange of information and the exchange of guidance parameters. Um, so if, um, 
if such information is exchanged, um, you can also make agreements on the, the quality of this information. And, well, you should agree on what is the minimum re um, the minimum quality required in order for road authorities to process OEM and act on OEM data, but also the other way around. Especially when we talk about um, the, the, the classification levels B and A of, of the, uh, the ISAT structure, um, the information should be trusted if vehicles are going to act on the on the guidance that is provided to them. So that is something needed uh, to be defined. I believe my time is up, and I have to hand over to Jan Elsberger. So thank you very much, Jap. So I'm Jan Asperger from Huawei. I'm responsible for uh, industry and uh, standardization activities related to uh, connected and automated driving. I received a kind invitation from Armin and the organizers of this webinar to give you an update on uh, smart roads uh, in China from an industry landscape and uh, standardization point of view. So this will not be sort of a very technical presentation, but rather bring you up to speed on what is going on in, in China. So if we go to the next uh, slide, please. So um, in China, uh, sort of related to connected and automated mobility, there's basically three uh, stakeholders from the government point of view. So the uh, NDRC, the National Development and Reform Committee, uh, Ministry of Industration and Information Technology, MIIT, and of course also the Ministry of Transport. <clears throat> and the um, overall targets or ambitions from a Chinese point of view does not really differ that much from, from EU, I would say. So the target is that by 2025, uh, industry ecosystem should be established and all necessary regulations in place. The level three market penetration of uh, vehicle fleet should be 30% on level four or five uh, commercial available in selected geographical areas and the cooperative ITS, 5G cell of E2X <clears throat> and smart road infrastructure should be uh, well underway along highways and in cities. And then by 2030, level three market penetration 70% and uh, level four or five general use along highways. So this is sort of the overall, overall ambition level. So next slide, please. Take some time to here. So <clears throat> this is show outlining the sort of overall industry landscape across the three uh, uh, concerned industry sectors, so roadside, automotive, and telecom, uh, from and, and also uh, classified according to policy and regulation, trade lobbying and industry organizations, and technology development and standards organizations. And uh, NDRC uh, is sort of working across all the industry sectors responsible for overall coordination and the investment project planning and, and sort of approving uh, investment plans. MIIT is working with uh, regulation for telecom and of course also regulation for the cell of VTX systems. On the road side, we have uh, Ministry of Transport responsible for expressways and uh, class one to four highways. And then we have uh, Ministry of Housing and Construction, which is responsible for uh, all urban urban constructions, in, including urban roads. <clears throat> we also have Energy Bureau, who is responsible for the charging infrastructure for electric vehicle. Ministry of Public Security, responsible for all uh, traffic signage and the Ministry of Natural Resource, who is responsible for uh, um, maps and, and uh, sort of issuing licenses for map providers. Uh, looking at trade lobbying and industry organizations, on the right-hand side, the Telecom, IMT 2020, sort of the lobbying organization for 3GPP technologies in China. We also have in the automotive space, uh, CAAM, that is the China Association of uh, Automo Automobile Manufacturers. We also have a China EV100, uh, that is a think tank and, and industry association for the uh, EV industry. Uh, on the road side, 
uh, I think relatively well known internationally is uh, CHTS, China Highway and Transportation Society. It was established already in 1921. I think it's quite present on the on the international scene. Then we also have ITS China uh, as, as a lobbying organization and um, uh, CTMA as the China Smart Traffic Management Industry Alliance. Then <clears throat> on the technology and uh, standards organization side, Telecom CCSA that also includes Celebi 2 x uh, standards. Then, uh, and, and also uh, CAICV, which is sort of on the borderline between standards and uh, industry organization, and also on the borderline between telecom and automotive. CAICV stands for China Industry Innovation Alliance for Intelligent and Connected Vehicles. And this is a sort of dedicated working on, on uh, in, in, in this area <clears throat> with uh, uh, technical specifications and also sort of lobbying efforts. Then we have SA China in automotive, and then we also have on the roadside uh, CITS, and also quite importantly uh, GTG, that is the highway branch of China Engineering Construction Standardization Association, uh, that is typically issuing all standards for the uh, roadside infrastructure. And then in the bottom of the slide, you see sort of the uh, as linkage to the main international organizations. So next slide, please. Uh, sort of looking at the status in China when it comes to smart road infrastructure standardization. Uh, <clears throat> and as sort of end of April, uh, a draft standard was issued uh, from JTGT uh, with the title General Technical Specification for Highway Auxiliary Facilities Adapted to Automated Driving. So the scope here is to sort of based on uh, uh, cooperative perception and cooperative maneuvering uh, outline the system architecture and technology requirements for the roadside equipment and services. So uh, the, the draft standard uh, includes an overall architecture for the roadside system, also the, the uh, related map mapping requirements, what information shall be included in the maps, uh, positioning requirements, uh, the requirements on the communication system, so latency, bandwidth requirements, etc. <clears throat> it also includes um, uh, requirements on uh, physical and digital signage for automated vehicles, requirements on, on the traffic control system, also requirements on the um, uh, capabilities uh, of the traffic sensing uh, equipment along the roadside, so which type of traffic situations uh, must be detected. Uh, and also then sort of general uh, requirements on the roadside uh, compute uh, equipment. So <clears throat> uh, compute capabilities in the edge servers, uh, memory sizes, etc. Uh, also requirements on the power supply and lightning. And then also in the architecture, there is sort of a, a service center, uh, which is sort of the central entity managing the type of services. So the document also outlines the, the capabilities required from the service center. And then last but not least, there is also uh, security related requirements. So this exists as a draft, and then the intent is to this is now open for comments in China, and the intent is to finalize that by uh, the fourth quarter this year. The work is led by uh, the uh, Research Institute of Highways, the National Highway Research Institute, and uh, a number of companies have been involved, uh, ICT Industry, uh, Huawei, Baidu, uh, Alibaba, also a number of navigation companies and also universities. Then the next plan under discussion, not fully agreed yet, is to uh, also develop a corresponding standard during 2021, which is uh, on smart road levels, which is uh, corresponding to, to the ISAT concept in, in Europe, which is uh, going to be uh, done through uh, TC204 in, uh, in uh, SAC in China. So this is sort of the status 
uh, on, on, on the road infrastructure related standardization. So if we go to the next slide, please. So here is a slider question from my side. I mean, <clears throat> from, from my company point of view, we uh, think that a certain level of global alignment is, is necessary, especially from sort of the vehicle point of view. So I would be curious to, to learn if there is anybody in the audience that have sort of some, some clear views on where we should drive this type of standardization. And I'm gonna look at sort of the results after this. So it's going to be a good good input for for further discussions. So next next slide, please. Uh, also to outline a little bit about the the road infrastructure technology providers in China. So uh, companies that are maybe not so well known uh, in Europe, uh, starting uh, on, on the cloud service side. So uh, providers of of uh, public cloud services and also the, the the services top of that. We have Alibaba, <clears throat> Tencent, Baidu, of course. Huawei is also a public cloud provider in China. Uh, Inspur, DD, that is the uh, logo on the right hand side. We also have a number of uh, high precision map uh, companies engaged. So Baidu, Navin Fu, uh, AMAP, ENG. On the edge intelligence side, uh, at, so, so uh, uh, edge servers uh, equipped with, with uh, AI capabilities, so Huawei, Alibaba, Inspur, and, and then of course on the communication side we have a number of different companies, so Huawei, Datang, uh, Nebula Link, uh, and also a number of companies providing the, the uh, chipsets and modules for the vehicle side. Uh, then uh, awareness sort of sensors, uh, Alua and Hikvision, uh, and um, Leiswau intelligent system for LIDAR, and, and also Huawei providing LIDAR and camera technologies, uh, and then also positioning uh, companies like Kongshun and, and the BD Star Navigation. So this is sort of just to give you uh, a little bit of information about uh, sort of key companies in uh, in the infrastructure side in China. And um, as you may note, I mean, Huawei is present on, on quite many of those areas. Uh, and since we also present on the vehicle side with autonomous driving capabilities, we are, may, <clears throat> we are quite uniquely positioned to have a good insight and understanding of, of the problems that needs to be solved here. So if you go to the next slide, which is also the last slide. So in China, 2018, no, this is not, can you back please? <laughs> Previous one, this one, yeah. So in, uh, in China, uh, already 2018, uh, framework and legislation for uh, testing of uh, autonomous vehicles on public roads was issued. And by today, uh, 109 test licenses has been issued uh, from, from different companies uh, covering 16 cities and highway sections in, uh, in uh, China. And the main cities is, is listed here and indicated uh, on the map with green. So Beijing, 59 licenses, Chongqing, uh, Shanghai, Pingtan, which is mostly for commercial vehicles, and also Shangsha. And uh, as you can see, some very well recognized European brands also, also obtained licenses in China and is um, engaged with in, in, in the industry activities there. And quite a lot of the results from those uh, different test sites has been used as a basis for the, for the draft standard on the <clears throat> infrastructure side. So this concludes my presentation. So let's see if there are any interesting questions in the Slido tool. Uh, so who should own and be accountable for digital infrastructures? To everyone, yeah, I mean, we are sort of a technology provider, so, so we don't have a strong view on that. 
I would think that the, it is the uh, road or city authority that is owning and, and being accountable for the digital infrastructure. That's my personal opinion. Uh, yes, I mean, to go into details of the draft Chinese standard, I think time will not permit here to, to sort of start a detailed discussion that we can discuss a little bit if, if there would be uh, a good venue in Europe to, to, to share a little bit more around this. As I said, from our point of view, we are very interested in, in, in securing global harmonization. Uh, and then how the business and hence implementing automated vehicles affected in the context, context of post-COVID-19 in China. I don't, I frankly don't have any, any understanding of insights into that. That is something that we can try to answer uh, offline. So if that was the last question, then I guess I hand back to Armin. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, and um, I'll I'll open uh, a kind of. Uh, I know that the time is over, and uh, it's always the same that we always the time is not enough. But uh, we can continue for for the next half hour up to four o'clock if you like. So um, if you if you like to pose further questions, uh, please don't hesitate to to do so. Um, I'd like to summarize what we have heard in these one and a half hours uh, in a kind of, uh, let's say, short short version, only a few minutes, and then we can come back to questions. And I invite uh, all speakers to to show up again uh, with this summary so that everyone can again identify who was uh, talking about what. Um, I started uh, with the, the OEM perspective. Um, and I'd like to, to uh, like, uh, not so, not so officially try to classify all the five uh, presentations into a kind of structure because I would name now myself as an infrastructure user because when we develop automated vehicles, we will use and need infrastructure for that. So I looked very much at ISET and ODD in an overview. Uh, maps availability and infrastructure invest were already questions on me. Jacqueline from ASFINAC, again, uh, as an infrastructure provider, explained in detail what EZ means and uh, if there's a relation to SAE levels was a very important question on that. I think the, the real-time traffic management, overall traffic perception and um, increasing vehicle perception by infrastructure are, are key topics of her presentation. Um, Thierry from uh, FERL uh, represents infrastructure research. Uh, he uh, mentioned a, a lot about uh, automation-ready framework to tackle the uncertainties, and especially the transition phase will be a very difficult one. But he also mentioned again the ISAT levels, um, um, and uh, the focus should be on specific use cases and no regret investments. Uh, then YAP followed. Uh, as an infrastructure service provider. Um, he uh, looked very much into infrastructure assisted driving um, and uh, transitions for limited ODDs is a very important part, especially when the first uh, cars are on the roads. Um, also, he uh, uh, mentioned the, the possibility of traffic management to avoid spillbacks and so traffic jams uh, with uh, the concept of linking fleet management OEMs uh, with road authorities by traffic management. I think this is also a very nice idea. Um, and um, a cross domain service center could be a very good solution for the future. Last but not least, Jan um, um, had uh, his presentation on smart roads in China, and I would say this is a kind of the infrastructure strategy which China just uh, shows in his. Uh, um, new uh, approach on on uh, regulatory framework for infrastructure for automated driving. So this is, I think, really uh, setting uh, government targets and having this impressive network between government and industry um, with the target of cooperative perception and smart road levels. Uh, this is uh, also very much in line with what we have heard uh, from European side. We understood that there are big players in 
China, like Huawei and others, who have a broad spectrum around the technologies which are necessary there. But I also like very much, Jan, uh, that you mentioned at last, uh, the global harmonization, which could be really uh, one of the key enablers for all of us to uh, speed up the technology and bring it uh, to life and to the people. So um, please uh, pose your questions on Slido uh, to whom you want. Um, I would, uh, if there's nobody mentioned, I would take uh, the opportunity to answer all directed to one of the speakers. So if we go back to Slido. Okay, thank you very much. Can we reach level four automation without better infrastructure? Well, I, then I, I'll take the question from myself. Um, I would simply say no. Um, uh, it's uh, depending on the use case, it's clear. We can start with use cases which may be able to, to work with this very limited uh, performance in the today's network. But I clearly see that there are big improvements necessary. So I like, again, the idea of no regret investments. And uh, that's what I just uh, tried to mention in my, in my slides when I talked about uh, very uh, dynamic uh, maps, high definition maps and traffic lights and uh, traffic uh, variable traffic signs being kind of first steps for in this direction, if this is nice as an answer. Then we have uh, expectations level, level four passenger cars in the mass market. We, we talked about that already. Uh, that's really uh, a crucial thing which we nobody can answer yet. And uh, there are so many uncertainties still in the in the room, let's say in the in the world. And um, um, we did big approaches from an industry side, uh, OEM industry and uh, supplier industry side, the whole value chain with uh, the white paper safety first for automated driving, which was issued in, in July um, last year. And we are just in the way to uh, a big consortium out of uh, 20 partners around uh, is uh, uh, stepping up to bring out an ISO technical report uh, based on this white paper. Uh, it's ISO 4804, which will show what are the architectural needs and, and all the requirements to deliver a safe automated uh, technology. So this is one of the answers and you will see that there are many things there which are not yet solved. So, so we will have a lot of work to do before this comes to the mass market. Who should own and be accountable uh, for digital infrastructures, uh, Jacqueline? Well, the question is which kind of digital infrastructure? I think um, in Europe, we, we have uh, many very good initiatives where we just um, a little bit test with this new ecosystem of roads, of infrastructure providers um, and of vehicles. So um, first we have to identify which data is really necessary and, and what what exactly which, which kind of data is, is required and then to see who is responsible and accountable. It's difficult, but I think we, we do really good first steps in identifying the, the needs and requirements of level three, level four cars. Yeah, do you also want to mention something around that? You had ideas around that, I think, as well? <clears throat> yes, my answer would be that um, uh, the ones owning and operating the, the digital infrastructures would be responsible. Of course, there's a technology element in there, so the, the, the supplier of the technology also has uh, responsibilities, but eventually we're going to use and apply the digital infrastructures to, uh, to operate traffic and to intervene in traffic. Um, therefore, um, the one doing that also has an uh, well, important responsibility and, and is accountable. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, now really a, a nice uh, answer to this question. Um, uh, back to Jacqueline, uh, two questions for you now. So maybe you could go on. Well, the first one I, I tried already to answer that ISO is a kind of describing the capability of the infrastructure to provide additional data, like also Yap um, has shown it in his presentation. 
When it comes to higher lev ISOT levels uh, or higher classification, um, of, of course, I mean, the ISOT right now is, is just a scheme. It's, it's a schematic description that infrastructure has the opportunity or the possibility to, to provide data um, to vehicles and also influence the development of automated driving. Um, we have to do it step by step. So a higher class definition would even not be right now the thing which we need to, to keep on working on, on a more specified way of describing the services, which we wanted to, to introduce with this uh, classification scheme. Could I, like, could I, I ask you that, yeah. yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, in, in a way it extends uh, the answer that I just gave. Um, although the ones operating digital infrastructure are accountable, there is still a level of, uh, of responsibility also at the uh, receiving end. Um, I, I think that's a good example of a level A infrastructure where there is cooperative driving. So there are operational instructions coming from an, an external source and still they should be validated somehow before uh, the vehicle acts on them. Um, in fact, we have been looking at a higher ISAT level than A, which would be uh, remote control driving. So from a remote control center, you remotely drive the vehicle. And I think the, 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 well, the common understanding today is that, that that should not be an option. The vehicle itself is, uh, is, is, is a safety feature, is tested, therefore it should be able to execute all its driving functions and can only be instructed or uh, send um, more detailed missions uh, that eventually should be executed by the vehicle. So um, that could be a higher level than A, but at the same time, a part of that is, is seems to be ruled out as an option. I fully agree to what you said. I, I would even would like to, to, to add, uh, and thank you for that. Um, um, the, the point is at last uh, that, uh, as you mentioned it, uh, the, the vehicle itself uh, will always be a kind of safety layer in this whole system. So, so at last, um, I, I cannot imagine, to be honest, even, even if I have seen so many projects already, uh, that there is a solution where the vehicle has no safety resp responsibility anymore. So um, maybe uh, it could be the case in a, in a very far future that the uh, remote uh, operation, uh, fully managed uh, vehicle fleet can deliver everything which is necessary so that the vehicle gets to its end but never ever the full safety uh, performance of of what is needed in traffic especially as long as it's mixed traffic okay um are the vehicles ready to receive data about infrastructure conditions and geofence definitions standards most used well this is a very broad question and uh, there are so many around um I can only say BMW is just working in Munich <laughs> with, the, with the local authorities on delivered, uh, getting uh, traffic light signals delivered uh, in, a safe t in a safe way. So this is not an easy task. And uh, I can say that we are far away from standards here. But there are many others which are available. Uh, and and uh, maybe Jan, do you have any insight into that? No, I think it's it's uh, on the standard side. It's it's quite fragmented, and, and there is no sort of uh, common platform in the industry where where these type of topics are discussed. And it probably also shows sort of that the, the, there is a lot of technology challenges that has to be solved first before we go into to real standardization. That that is my take on this. Thierry, do you have any any uh, insights into that uh, from the research part of point of view? Well, actually, not not much more than what you highlighted. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, there is a group actually also led uh, by Sweden on the geo fencing in particular, uh, with some um, let's say demonstration and development and with buses, for instance. Uh, but not nothing more than that. So very far from being uh, ready to for a standard. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think also this is a matter of um, We'll be talking about research a lot now here, but standardization is a is a key enabler for speeding up the the 
uh, development uh, of automation solutions on in the road traffic area so this uh, i think is is really one of the key uh, things to be solved uh, in the future um so um I've seen uh, this question up, uh, the HD maps reliability, we had that in the past uh, in the, uh, between the uh, presentations. So I think this can only be solved by having this kind of um, uh, layer and, and um, let's say um, store enough uh, data in the car so that you don't uh, have to rely too much. Um, there's one question, if we are building a test bed today for technologies that will be in production in 10 years, what should we prioritize? That's a very good question, really. Um, I think this is exactly what we are just um, trying and I'd like to, to span here uh, the, the uh, bow a bit further above, uh, away from, from this workshop here. I'm also in the drafting group of the CCAM uh, partnership to be uh, established uh, till the end of the year. And in this partnership, we are looking very much into the use cases uh, deeper than we had uh, done this before. The arcade project in which framework we are working here and discussing here just is supporting this as well. And uh, we will look very much into into the prioritization of research needs um, by understanding better what are the key use cases uh, for the next 10 years. So this is exactly one of the core targets and the, the biggest discussion which we have with the Commission for, for prioritizing the research money for the next 10 years. Um, it's uh, definitely about urban mobility and we will hopefully launch a first project understanding that better for the next two or three years and then afterwards going deeper into understanding this question. This is really one of the key questions for the next 10 years. Okay, one other question uh, from Roberto Blanco, which is nice. Uh, I like that idea. Um, uh, but I like to, to discuss more with real persons, but okay, that's nice. Uh, level one to five. Um, okay. Um, well, okay, this is a kind of um, formal and systematic question. Jacqueline, do you have some insights on, on this um, level of one to five and A to D with the ISAT? Well, the, the funny um, stories maybe that at the beginning we had a kind of level one to five classification, but got some some feedback from automotive industry and also other stakeholders that it would make sense to not use the same kind of, um, in fact, numbering or naming convention for infrastructure than for for vehicles. So that's why we 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 are ended up at the letter classification right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think and it is it's still good. very it's difficult in, in which maybe what, what we should always have in mind. I mean, uh, even an SAE level clearance, um, I mean, could, could elaborate it better, um, but it is not clear which functionality for which automation level needs which kind of infrastructure support. So there to find a one-to-one -one matching um, might be difficult. But we are working on on this um, standardization or this this common agreement in what is a kind of infrastructure support level. What Maybe. is really needed from a traffic management point of view? Just discussing this uh, between us, I think it's a good idea to to uh, refer this in a chapter of the next air truck roadmap to really look deeper into where can we say cut. Uh, the limits of uh, what are uh, good relations. So maybe it's not a good idea to try a level four car on country roads with an ISAT level D. So we can maybe separate some corners and, and uh, focus on some relations between vehicles and, and infrastructure levels. So this uh, could be some, some kind of future content we, we have to elaborate further. Thierry? Yeah. Yeah, just uh, to second what uh, what you mentioned, actually, that was also one of the uh, recommendations at the workshop last time. So to try to see the combination between the A and the A, B, C, D and the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's really uh, definitely something useful. Yeah. Jan, did you want to mention something? 
No, I think I fully second what what uh, what Thierry and yourself said on that topic. So. So now being uh, five minutes from five minutes to four, um, I'd like to to stop here. Any questions which uh, have been mentioned are documented anyway, so we can definitely come back uh, and look into these and try to report as good as possible with the documents um, uh, established after after this webinar. Um, now I'd like to give uh, famous last words to to every one of you, maybe. Uh, in the order, uh, the opposite of the of the uh, presentation. So, Jan, if you would like to start with the famous last word here. Yeah, I don't know exactly what this tradition with famous last words is. This, this is the first <laughs> time I'm attending this type of event, but it it was uh, very very interesting for me and and very good questions. And uh, again, I mean, we we are very keen on sort of uh, working on trying to secure global alignment. Uh, that's sort of one one of the key targets from, from our company point of view. So that would be my last appeal then, that global alignment is a keyword. Super. Yep. Yep, if you like to continue. Yep, the, the screen ah, okay. moves. Yes, well, thank you for, for the organization of this session and the opportunity to present some of our work and ideas for um, um, well op operational elements in the in the future. Um, personally, I think this is a fascinating topic. What you touched upon uh, last, the the relation between infrastructure, intelligence levels, and, and different levels of vehicle automation and how they interact. Um, that's simply an interesting topic. Um, yeah, so let's continue this work. Uh, on your session next week. Thank you very much, uh, Thierry. Yeah, so well, maybe I, I'd like to say that uh, or to reiterate the this great need for the synergy between the infrastructure progress and then the, the vehicle. And I think this last suggestion of uh, uh, cross-cutting the uh, in infrastructure uh, A, B, C, D, and the uh, say level one to five on the vehicle is a great example of that. Uh, the second point is about the no regret investment. I think this is really crucial because we are talking about a lot of money, and here the globalization may play a role, hopefully, but still uh, this will represent a, a lot of money, so we we can't miss in a way the turn. Um, and then uh, I'd like to thank very much. Uh, everyone and especially Armin and, um, and Stefan for the invitation. Thank you. Jacqueline, your words. I can also just underline the, the importance of working right now together to identify um, the different worlds of the vehicles industry, also the infrastructure industry, and uh, seeing this, this challenge and opportunity right now to, to work together and find a common solution. And I'm, I'm really glad that, and thank you to you, that I was allowed to talk here and give my perspective, because I think uh, this, this webinar now showed um, how difficult this whole ecosystem is and, and how far we already um, we are in, in defining solutions. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Jacqueline, very much. Um, I also like to, to thank everybody of you, and I'm very, very happy that we managed to do this not too late after the planned uh, symposium of the TRA in Helsinki, which couldn't happen uh, due to these circumstances. And uh, I must say it's my first experience doing a webinar like this, and I really i am totally happy and uh, completely um, yeah, happy about uh, how this ran, and and I think we really managed to do a, a good job here. Hopefully, we get some good feedback from the community which was present. And now I'd like to hand over to Stefan to close. Thank you very much again. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Armin. And uh, I would also like to join you to in thanking all the speakers. I mean, for me, it was also extremely insightful. Learned a lot, and as I mean said, I think it will really help us as well in identifying the the priorities and where we need to focus next for the for the actions, which is yeah the main purpose of, of Arcade and support the Commission with with identifying these priorities. So thank you again to all of you. I've seen we have we had a very large 
audience. So I noted up to 150 participants uh, at the peak time uh, from all the regions, not only across Europe, but as well Asia, uh, US and also Middle East. So thank you to all the attendees for joining us in very early or very late, depending on where you are. And so I would just like to say that because of, indeed we might not have been able to answer all the questions or there is still some interest, we uh, propose to let open now the Slido uh, poll uh, and questions. So, so we will be answering or doing our best to answer the questions until, until five o'clock. So please submit your questions there. Um, and then on the next slide, so I would like to um, yeah, just mention that this was the first webinar uh, from the uh, UCAT symposium. So our idea was to spread the different webinars across the, the time until the end of the year as a transition towards the UCAT 2021 conference, which will be take place next year. So until then, I hope you will be able as well to join the next webinars we are planning. So the first, the next one will be on validation of connected and automated vehicles around mid-June. And then in fall, we'll have two others, one on sustainability of transport and the other one on common descriptions and use cases. So with that, thank you very much again for joining. Uh, I wish you still good evening or afternoon or morning, to, depending on where you are. And uh, thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks.